are now only a few days away from the Australian Grand Prix and the question on everyone's mind is can anyone stop Red Bull from dominating the Grand Prix and if they can, how can they do it? Well, that is the question that I'm going to be exploring in today's video as we continue to build up and preview the upcoming Australian Grand Prix. We're going to be looking at the data from the first two races to get an idea of exactly where Red Bull and their rivals are strong or weak at. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more F1 content. Now, let's get to the video. Firstly, let's take a look at the Albert Park circuit layout and see what we can learn. The circuit layout changed in 2022 from its previous layout. The old layout featured a tight chicane between the current Turn 8 and Turn 9. The profile of some of the corners were different as well. Turn 1, Turn 3 and Turn 6 were all widened on entry to try and help promote some more racing by in effect allowing for slightly different lines to be taken in the hope to increase overtakes. At Turn 6 the entry was made significantly faster which kind of makes sense. The next big change came after the far chicane on the run to what will be the turn 11 tight right hander. This corner was extended and widened once again to allow more racing lines to be taken. This extension increased the stop required which was done to try and help promote more overtakes by having a bigger braking zone. Finally turn 13 was adjusted by once again widening the corner at the apex similarly to turn 1 and turn 3. But what effect did this have on the circuit at Albert Park? Well, the effect was actually positive. Overtakes increased massively, as the number of overtakes in 2022 was higher than in 2017, 2018 and 2019 combined. And I guess you could say 2020 and 2021 since I didn't actually race there. However, the cars also changed for 2022 and that definitely would have made a factor. This year though, I think could be a real test to see if the circuit changes has helped for the racing. And the reason I say this is because at least right now, it seems like overtaking has been much more difficult in 2023 versus 2022. The Bahrain Grand Prix this year saw a significant decrease in on-track overtakes, with only 37 on-track overtakes, down from 78 the year before. Saudi Arabia did actually have an increase in overtakes with 36, which is up from 32 last year. However, this year's Saudi Arabian Grand Prix had two front runners not starting in the top 10, which would have skewed the figures somewhat. Last year's Australian Grand Prix had 34 on track overtakes, so it will be interesting to see if this year's race can maintain that figure. To try and help maintain that figure, there has been a fourth DRS zone introduced for this year's race, and that is on the run to the fast turn 9, turn 10 chicane. This was almost used last year, but they abandoned it after Friday practice, but this year, it does look like it will definitely be used all weekend long. We will come back to DRS shortly, so stick around for that for DRS chat, because it will be very important when in relation to this weekend's Grand Prix. Overall, the circuit changes has made Albert Park, in my opinion, more in line with what Saudi Arabia is, which is, it's essentially a flat out blast around the circuit. The last thing with regards to the circuit is the surface of the track. On one of my preview videos for Saudi Arabia, I compared the surface of Bahrain and Saudi Arabia using a sandpaper analogy when talking about the surface differences. The surface in Bahrain was a very coarse and rough surface, which led to high tyre wear, whereas Saudi Arabia was a very smooth surface. But what about Australia? Well, Australia is very similar to Saudi Arabia. The surface at Australia is a very smooth surface, which means that sadly tyre wear is not very high. With this low tyre wear, pit stop strategy is going to be a pretty straightforward strategy, which will be a one stop. In the previous race, everyone was able to easily do the Grand Prix on a set of mediums and hard tyres. Alex Albon in the Williams actually did the entire Grand Prix on a set of hard tyres and then boxed on the penultimate lap for a set of soft tyres so that he could satisfy the regulations. With this in mind, Pirelli will be taking the C2, C3 and C4 compound of tyres and the soft tyre is actually a step harder than at last year's Grand Prix because last year they had the C5. I imagine the reason for this is to try and make the soft tyre somewhat usable for the Grand Prix as last year it was essentially just a qualifying tyre. Will that mix up the strategy somewhat? 
personally, I don't think it will, but a late safety car could see some drivers changing onto the soft tyre, whereas last year they probably wouldn't have bothered. Now, let's look at some more data and let's get back to DRS. I mentioned earlier that I would be talking about DRS, and the reason for this is because I have a feeling that the DRS is going to play a very important role in this year's qualifying and also Grand Prix. With the introduction of a fourth DRS zone, all of the straight line parts of the circuit are essentially a DRS zone now. This is probably the highest percentage of DRS usage of any circuit all year, and that means that a car with an effective DRS will be strong here. So, who does this benefit? Well, one team that it does not benefit is the Aston Martins. And how can we tell this? Well, let's take a look back at Saudi Arabia and qualifying. This graph is from the fastest lap of Fernando Alonso and Charles Leclerc from qualifying. And what does the telemetry data tell us? Well, the data tells us that when DRS is activated, you can see that the straight line speed of the Ferrari is much higher than the straight line speed of the Aston Martin. This graph also shows us that the Aston Martin DRS drag reduction is only approximately 20.7%. This is actually quite low when compared to their rivals. Let's compare that with the Ferrari. The Ferrari of Carlos Sainz had a drag reduction of approximately 28% when opening the DRS in Saudi Arabia. And this is why the qualifying graph with Leclerc and Alonso shows such a large disparity when getting to the top speed. Basically, the Aston Martin does not gain as much straight line speed when using DRS, essentially meaning that they don't dump as much drag as their rivals. And this is really going to hamper them when it comes to qualifying if it's fully dry. This could mean that in qualifying, Aston Martin might actually struggle to get into the top four if DRS is as powerful as it potentially could be. The upside for Aston Martin though is of course that in Sector 3 they have quite a few heavier braking zones. These heavier braking zones will help the Aston Martin as they are still very strong when it comes to braking as both Saudi Arabia and Bahrain have shown. Not only this, but as Saudi Arabia showed, Aston Martin have a very, very strong race car. So they may not be as strong in qualifying, but they could almost certainly have a better race car. But what about the Red Bull team? How will they manage with the DRS? Well, for Red Bull, this is actually going to play into their hands, which could be disappointing for anyone who is not a Max Verstappen or Sergio Perez fan. Yes, the Red Bull in Saudi Arabia had incredible straight line speed, and this was exacerbated when the DRS was activated. But why was this? Well, once again, let's take a look at the DRS drag reduction graphs from Saudi Arabia. As mentioned, the Aston Martin only had a 20.7 reduction with DRS, and Ferrari had approximately a 28% reduction, but Red Bull had a staggering 31.5% drag reduction when using the DRS, which means that even though Red Bull was lightning fast in a straight line, they were even more lightning fast, if that makes sense, when the DRS was activated. No other team had as high of a drag reduction figure as the Red Bull did. This is why the overtakes for Max Verstappen were incredibly easy, such as the one when he blew past the Mercedes of George Russell and left Martin Brundle simply saying, what? This is a huge advantage for Red Bull, as this means that they can crank on the downforce and maintain a straight line speed advantage. If they do this, they can be fast in a straight line and have incredible cornering performance. Not that they don't already have this, mind you. Also, if there is rain around, then their increase in rear wing angle can and probably should help them should the circuit be wet at any stage. What about the Mercedes, as I've not really spoken too much about them? Well, let's take a look at their drag reduction graph. For the Mercedes, their drag reduction was not particularly too powerful. It was better than the Aston Martin, but it was worse than the Ferrari and Red Bulls. This could explain why Mercedes struggled a lot in qualifying in Saudi Arabia, with Hamilton being very far down the field, and George Russell not being able to fight the Aston Martin of Fernando Alonso, or the Ferrari of Charles Leclerc. But there is no doubting that their car had great race pace. When Russell was pushing flat out to try and stay with Fernando Alonso at the end of the race, as you can see from this data, 
Both drivers were lapping at times within one tenth of a second of each other. This tells me that the Mercedes at least has a great race car. We also saw this in Bahrain, that when the Mercedes were on the harder tyres, they were faster than the Ferrari, which was also the case once again in Saudi Arabia. This could be a negative for their rivals Ferrari and a positive for the Mercedes. Ferrari seem to struggle on the hardest tyres and this could play perfectly into the hands of Mercedes in the race, just not so much in qualifying. So really what we can gather is, yes, Ferrari have a fantastic qualifying car and I think with their drag reduction, they should be ahead of Mercedes and Aston Martin. But when it comes to race pace, Aston Martin and Mercedes have a better race car than Ferrari. But what about the question from the beginning of the video, which is, can anyone take the fight to Red Bull and stop them from dominating this weekend? Well, based on the data from the first two races, the answer is probably not no. However, there has been a couple of tweets from round two to now. The FIA is no longer applying its limit to teams when it comes to porpoising. This might be a minor change, but if the likes of Ferrari, who were bouncing a lot last year, can now change their car to maybe make it run a little bit lower to the ground and bounce a little bit more, could we maybe see some teams do that and find a way to be a little bit closer to the Red Bull team? Well, we'll just have to wait and find out. But as of right now, the simple answer is, sadly, no. I don't really think we will see anyone be able to take the fight to Red Bull. It might be that we have to wait until after this mini break when we see some teams bring a lot of upgrades to the next Grand Prix after Australia that some teams are maybe a little bit closer to Red Bull. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video and if you did, as always, comment, leave a like and subscribe for more F1 content analysis and F1 content in general. Thank you all so much for watching.